Okay. So welcome to the first ISS Tuesday talk after our summer break. Our topic today is transforming organizations, engaging aesthetic practices for imagining sustainable futures by our ISS fellow, Anke Strauss. Anke is researching questions of management and organization with the aim to identify ways how we organize sustainably our working and living together on this planet. She's focusing thereby on the intersection between artistic and economic modes of production, and among others on alternative modes of organization, relational ontologies and aesthetics. She holds a PhD from the University of Essex on collaborative transdisciplinary learning environments. And currently she is a lecturer at Eberswald University for sustainable development, where she teaches, among others, on strategic sustainability management, and we are very happy to have her as fellow until the middle of 2022. Before we start, please just keep in mind that this session will be recorded. And now, Anke, please, the digital floor is yours. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Achim. Uh, yeah, a warm welcome. I'm, um, I'm a bit nervous of uh, talking about uh, what I am just started uh, to do, I've um, joined uh, the ISS in uh, mid-June. And um, yeah, but in mid-June, the term wasn't over yet. So I fell in this hole of, uh, <laughs> of uh, university work, as you probably all know that. And um, yeah, and now um, I was kind of forced to like put myself together and focus again. And I'm really grateful for that opportunity and that I can actually start um, the, the, the talk, the ISS talk, um, um, yeah, after the summer break. So as I just said, I just started my project and I would like to use this time not to present um, any definite results, but to try to map the contours of the project and the path into the research landscape that such procedures open up. And um, when thinking about uh, what, how I would start, I remembered a little paragraph I wrote in April, 2020, when something happened and nobody would have guessed was possible, that is uh, the world was coming to an halt. And I would like to read that first before I jump into what I wanna do. The sea virus curbs space-time in a paradox manner. Its temporality surges like a black hole. From a distance, time seems to become infinitely slow, a standstill. But being part of its event horizon, the zone that discerns the black hole from its surrounding, time is fast, so fast. All these calls, all these emails, all these documents, a huge wave that washes away the boundary that distinguishes work life from private life. All this cooking and cleaning, a total intensification of labor that makes us gravitate into the center of sweeping exploitation. Others hover in space, lost in the infinity of disorientation. But then a black hole only appears black from outside. In its inescapable inside, one finds color and so much light. Maybe it's time to let go of fantasies of a successful, of a productive, of the so-called good life that have guided us in the past and that have fed an optimism that started to become cruel for more and more people. Maybe it's time to explore this new topography of, for spaces of possibility to redirect our fantasies, desires, and practices of being in and being with the world. Yes, that was April 2020. And uh, since then, since then, more than a year has passed and we've been through the first and the second and the third wave and we're waiting for the next to come. And we have seen fire and wind and water gone wild while institutions and social bonds that we've always perceived as solid as rocks start to crumble. Maybe they were crumbling already a, a longer time, but uh, now it was really apparent. My colleague and friend Monica Costera calls it with reference to Sigmund Baumann, an apocalypse, a process of crumbling that is violent and fills the air with debris and dust so that it's difficult to breathe or to, to, to see. Yet apocalypse, according to her, also means revelation, the revelation of values these crumbling institutions were based upon. Like her, I affiliate with management and organization studies. And I, like her, I do that in a critical manner. And one thing that these multiple crises have revealed 
to me yet another time is a gap. A gap between the narratives of control that management promises and the increasing lack of control, be it present or future, that in turn is met with yet more sophisticated technologies of control. But despite this dominant presence, management is not organizations. Um, organizations are about relationships. Organizations are processes that interconnect individual bodies, human bodies, non-human bodies, bodies of knowledge, bodies of water, etc. And organizations actualize social bodies and management is but one possible way of organizing. Management enables certain ways of thinking and doing and disables others. Management as this one possible way of organizing, however, comes with a whole network of concepts and metaphors and socio-material practices and technologies that constitute and maintain the ubiquity that more often than not renders it invisible. So we often do not realize that we are using management logics in, in perceiving or organizing the world around us. So Ethan Miller, that's um, what I, I'm currently reading a really good book of him, um, Reimagining Livelihoods. He, for instance, has shown how the social material technology of counting that is constitutively linked to management has formed sustainability geometry that separates reality into three different spheres. The economy, the society, and uh, uh, the nature and separated, they do not only have to be managed, either in trade-offs or in balancing acts or in reconnecting uh, acts, but, uh, but the problem is that this is re easily ontologized. That is, they are rendered as accurate description of reality itself. So the description of reality seems to become reality itself. And the problem that I think is at the root of it, and I think this becomes more and more visible, the more institutions fail to tackle um, our common survival on this planet, is that this mode of organizing constantly produces hierarchical relationships. And um, these hierarchical relationships are often between autonomous subjects that are independent, and dependent objects that need to be managed. And these objects include not only nature or non-humans, but also humans. So in management and organization studies, um, this critique of the way we you know, disconnect and reconnect certain like the world in order to manage it um, has been center of more sociological perspectives that actively foster research on alternative ways of organizing. But in the field of sustainability in management organization studies, uh, these critical voices are very like, rare. And um, only recently there have been voices that highlight the unsustainable character of organization practice and research that treat sustainability as a business case. Um, Bobby Benjery, Mary Phillips, Sarah Ajean, they all insist on the need for developing a, a relational um, perspective on organizations for an engaged research um, on sustainable ways of organizing. Yes, so that's the aim, but um, this is easier said than done because, um, well, given the ubiquity of the network of concept practices, institutions, metaphors, technologies, et cetera, um, of a management logic that maintain hierarchical relationships, um, it's very, very difficult to think differently. So an example for it is, um, there are two researchers, Jason Good and Andrea Thorpe, who um, try to contribute to this um, relational approach on sustainable organizing theory and practice. And they criticize current management, sustainability management approach as piecemeal and dualistic and develop a spatial temporal framework for mapping 
um, nature organizational relationships. I think that's a good, good first um, move. Um, but um, because they they start to do away with usually the problem with management is that they create the idea that um, of, of time and spaceless, spacelessness, as it doesn't really matter, the same technique of management can be applied to place A and place B and there is no difference. And they do away with this. But at the same time, they do not escape this mode, they criticize, because they use this framework, and I quote them, um, to aim at enabling organizations to better manage their relations with the natural world. So they fall back on the dualism between organization and nat nature and um, that these are two distinct things that need to be managed. So for me, the question really is, if this is so difficult, which apparently it is, um, what enables us to rethink the way we perceive, practice and maintain relationships with the world and its inhabitants human and non-human, uh, without making use of these recurrent ways of perceiving, thinking, and organizing them. I personally feel very much affiliated with the hopeful project of um, Gibson Graham's Reading for Difference, or Anna Lovmart Singh's Art of Noticing, that both make visible alternative organizing practices as present in the here and now. These are organizing practices that usually escape relationships of submissions and dominance or notions of progress and are therefore often overlooked because this is the way we search for. This is, this is what we, search, what we are searching for with the modes of, um, of thinking. So I do so um, by exploring aesthetic practices and principles of organizing that aim at rendering open spaces of possibility. So that's what I'm searching for. And I do so in quite many different ways. Um, so I started a, a project, a research project called Working Utopia some, some years ago, and it has come to an end um, a year and a half ago, but um, somehow the relationships are still there. So I, I would like to go on with that. So, and in this Working Utopias project, I started to explore um, artist-run organizations. So um, I went to artists who organize their work life or aim at organizing their work lives collectively and asked them, how, how, how do they actually do it? And what I was originally interested in was um, how to organize sociality under conditions of radical individualism. And what is interesting that um, I did not find a certain type of relating or relationships in these organizations, but I found a lot of principles of organizing that were meant to keep the relationships open for negotiations, for ongoing negotiations. And you can see two, two um, places I went to, um, the, the one further down, it's called Autobahn William Willem Cafe Dallas, a long, 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 long name for a very small space. It's 18 square meters, I think, and the porch. And it's in the Italian Alps. And the other one, it's a short name, Path Performing Art Forum. It's in saint Herm in France. And it is an old monastery of 6,500 square meters. So it's exactly the contrast, but they talk about the way they do these things very similarly. And what I found in, um, and what is interesting in Puff, it's so, so big and uh, it's self-funded. So all the artists going there, they fund the, the whole structure of the thing. So they're not dependent on state funding. And it's very important for them that they're not. And it is uh, self-organized. Um, so there are very few people working for the um, um, administration of it. Uh, but when you're there, you need to find your own room or a bed or a <laughs> workspace. And this, this place is a place for work where artists can focus on their work. And it runs on three or, and now it's four rules. 
and I want to share them with you. The first one is don't leave traces. Um, make it possible for others. The doer decides and mind a symmetry. And all of them um, apply at the same time. And uh, there are also some explanations for that. So don't leave traces means traces are unwanted or uninvited marks, material or Im immaterial, left in the space or in others. So the, the um, so you can read it as what, what, whatever you're not using at the very moment, apart from your own room, needs to be cleared from any mark of your presence so that it's available for everybody. So it's not the typical, um, uh, how you call it, um, 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 occupying a space before uh, before breakfast um, uh, close to the pool. So when you come back, you can you can use it. So this is this is exactly the opposite. So when you don't use it, you clear it. It's very closely related to make it possible for others. That is an opportunity to open spaces for others by, for instance, showing a re rehearsal that you're doing, a movie or giving a lecture, starting a discussion or help somebody. So um, I just leave it for there. And the third one is the doer decides. That means that um, not people who constantly discuss things decide, but the ones who are actually doing it, they decide. And, and the rule also has kind of um, um, is related to the other two rules. That means, well, you're not alone. You know, you need to take into consideration whatever you do has effects on others and are these maybe traces that others would mind. And the last thing that I, um, they introduced um, two years ago um, is mind asymmetry because the, the outside world um, is existent and we all bring our, um, yeah, our positions of power, our, um, uh, our different experiences, uh, et cetera, into this space. And we should um, think about this difference and, um, and mind boundaries. And there might be that my boundary is not your boundary. And, um, you should be open to be challenged your own position and your own, yeah, proposition, what you want to do or what you, you plan to do in this space. And as these rules are interrelated, they create this paradox because they kind of set boundaries and have openings and you have to negotiate every time you're there what this actually means. And what is interesting here is that next to these principles, um, there are, um, um, yeah, they, they, they are, um, uh, they are cited by um, by aesthetic practices that are meant to create atmospheres that support openness. Um, I can talk about it a little bit, maybe on the side or so. Um, because I don't think it's time for that at the moment. But central for me is that these principles and also these aesthetics that they apply are uh, meant to create um, a certain affective state that many describe as abundance. And that's interesting. Um, and I brought um, a, a little piece of interview um, on, on this, this notion of abundance with, you, uh, with me to share it with you, because I think it's, um, it's a different mode of, of, of thinking and acting that to me is very important uh, for transformation research. So um, this is what she says. Um, so if you think of scarcity as a kind of baseline practice under capitalist colonial society, it's always exploitative. It's always accumulative. You never have enough. So this is the kind of baseline we all resonate with under these conditions of life and that we all reproduce because your feelings are attuned to that rhythm. This rhythm sounds like, oh, he's going to leave me for somebody better, or I'm going to lose my job. 
But being attuned to a rhythm of abundance and not that of scarcity allows me to make different kinds of connections between knowledge, between feelings, between states of being. And I see when people also spend time here that it starts to work on them. Um, whoops, there actually something, I cannot really read it. Um, can you read it? Well, I can't. So what, what does this sense of abundance do? It implies that multiple things can coexist and learn and benefit from each other's difference rather than mediate. It, if this was just a community, even a community with the best friends doing the things I love to do, I wouldn't enjoy it as much because what I like here is that even if I'm very focused on one kind of work or a set of topics that is really important to me, the fact that other things that are totally alien to me, even contradictory, exist in the same space and I have access to it and I can enter in a conversation with is so much richer than just a one topic community. So that's what's precious for me, is the capacity to maintain the difference next to each other. So this is just, um, I'll go back to the presentation mode. So this is just um, the, the, the starting point of you know, all this material that I've got. Uh, and I would like to further my interviews with uh, members of artist run organizations, just because they are talking about these things very, very differently. And I think there's a lot of potential in it. So end of August, I'm going to a uh, performance artist gathering in Dresden that I've co-organized um, to talk about um, the questions of uh, how to work and be together in times of COVID, but also in times of crime crisis. So, you know, in these new situations, what, how can you recreate moments of abundance um, where scarcity is so, so heavy on you? Um, I also started to experiment in worship formats with um, such aesthetic questions of organizing and or organizing differently. And I would be more than happy, and I'm looking to David, <laughs> if anybody of you would like to co-create such experience with me uh, at IISS. Um, yeah, so that's just a, a side invitation for that. Um, and there's another realm of experimental researches, a research that I'm involved in, and that's not so much about space, but it's about time. To be precise, it involves the future, um, or I would rather call it futuring. Um, it's it's a it's a way of you know doing uh, well. I use speculative scenarios to ask about what are desirable futures instead of probable futures. Um, so I have been collaborating with uh, performance artists, but also um, transformation designers to experiment with speculative um, scenario narratives that render the future not only open instead of determined, but also as something that can be shaped together with others. And um, and I've done that in different contexts. And what you see is like my first um, tryout. Um, it was in a former concrete factory in Brandenburg that was in a, that was standing in a nature reserve and um, was waiting to be, you say, reawakened um, as something. And this something, um, the, the the desire was to create. Um, a different, uh, a different place. Uh, there were cultural producers who have um, bought it, and they wanted to create um, a different place um, that is uh, sustainable in some way. And um, but they didn't know what to do with this. So um, I did an, um, a master's course on um, okay, this is not a concrete factory. So what is it? And we developed um, what we call speculative scenarios. Um, speculative scenarios, um, they do not, um, they contrast to conventional scenarios um, in that they do not seek legitimacy through like big data or big numbers or an, um, a reference to past developments. 
but um, they gain legitimacy through the way they are crafted, really. So their narratives and, and how they are performed. So there are these two dimensions of narratives and um, how they can create desire for a different uh, future than what we already all seem to know. So the, the way they are crafted means that um, they connect um, various um, various different events and um, and um, elements that we already know uh, in a new way um, to to draw new traje tra trajectories into the future. Um, and uh, also the way they are performed makes a, a big difference. Um, so we usually use, um, well, there can be personas, um, um, students develop personas that, um, that might be carriers of these scenarios and they, um, they um, tell, tell uh, stories from the future, for instance. But they can also be um, the use of the materiality of a particular space, like here in the concrete factory, as sensual connectors that allow imagining and desiring alternative futures. We always call it time machines, where you can already sense the futures at your fingertips. Um, this, is, this is what we did in, in uh, Stolpe, that's the place. Uh, where we actually used the premises of the concrete factory to re, um, redo the, 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 the physical spaces and open them up for a future use where you can already try out how it might feel like. Um, this was really interesting because that um, this, this connection to space and this ex experimental connection to space um, really opened up um, this sense of possibility for the ones we invited. We invited everybody who wanted to, you know, see the future already. And it was so convincing that um, some of them wanted to sign up for something, for some workshops that we fictionally uh, introduced because they thought it was becoming real. So it's, and it, this is always interesting when people start to confuse something imaginary with the presence. Um, yeah, if you want to, so I, I stop here, I think if you want to know more about this, like all of this, you can go to um, working-utopias.com. Um, I think it's also somewhere in the presentation, I put the, the address, the URL in there. Yeah, so um, this is, uh, these are the first steps into the field and um, let's go back to the black hole, um, which means that, so it's, these explorations of space and time for possibilities of re-perceiving, rethinking, redoing our being with others on this planet. They do not obviously follow robust criteria of social science methods. They can't. And um, I think they shouldn't. Um, these phenomena of atmospheres, of imagination, of affect, etc., are much more ephemeral and hard to pin down, but they effectuate openings that are worth exploring, that's what I think. It's just like this black hole that is present in a peculiar absence. And so I'm more than happy to find uh, core explorers, core travelers and possibility makers for this. And that's why I'm very happy that I could share this with you today. I don't know the time, but... Uh... Well, thanks, Anke. You are perfectly in time, actually. We still have now half an hour about left for discussions. Thank you very much, first of all, for your presentation. For the discussion, please use either your raise hand function at Zoom or raise your hand actually, as we are not so many people, I could actually see them. And now with this short um, house rules, who would like to kick us off with questions, comments, or other ideas? Ilan, please. Um, thanks very much, Annika. It's a wonderful presentation, a lot of very rich ideas that I would love to explore further and understand more. Um, one specific um, response I had to your idea of abundance, the, mm -hmm. the comments on abundance, an alternative to that, that that appeals to me, the abundance as in a sense, as a reflection on the way that people do look at the world in some sense, scarcity, abundance um, dynamic is 
con concerning for obvious reasons and, and as you allude to it. An alternative that um, we've discussed in a different forum in the Research Institute for Humanity and Nature, their feast project on food consumption and production, um, spends a lot of time with the idea of sufficiency mm -hmm. rather than of plenty or of scarcity. But what is needed, and that that is not an absolute term uh, in any sense as scarcity may be, but rather a cultural and contextually um, loaded, if you will, um, reference to what, what actually makes the relationships and the functioning of different parts of the population. So it is also in a certain sense, an, uh, a non-hierarchical perspective mm -hmm. or can be. So anyway, I just wanna suggest that as, as a, another term or another approach in, in thinking about this. Um, this, that's one thing. So let me leave it there. I'll come back yeah. with something else maybe later if there's time. Yeah, well, well, shall I answer that right away? Is that, mm. I mean, yeah, thank you. Um, it, it is, I, I know what you mean with, or what you're, what you're um, uncomfortable with, with the word of abundance. Um, because it's very much uh, linked to over overconsumption and all these kind of, especially in the West. Um, um, and there's always this discussion of, um, shall we use these words? Because abundance used, used to be very much connected with nature. You know, when you think about seeds or, you know, this is nature lives off abundance. That's, that's um, how it survives. Um, and um, and the, it, the term has been kind of co-opted somehow in this uh, consumerist way of approaching, um, well, or, or sus sustaining <laughs> growth-based economies, of course. And the question is, shall, shall we, you know, re-appropriate re, um, these terms or shall we go for something else? And, um, but sufficient, and, and I like the, I, the sufficiency term in, in contrast to scarcity. Um, but, and at the same time, we live in this consumerist world and it's not as appealing as abundance. You know what I mean? It's um, sufficiency seems to like this, that's the problem also with, um, um, with uh, like other terms that, that um, have, um, that we use in post growth or degrowth um, discussions, right? That pe they are not really appealing to appealing, uh, people who are used to, um, well, the, the conditions we live in, in the Western world, at least. But yeah, so there's a, a lot of talk there, <laughs> potential for. Yeah. Yeah. I saw David has raised his hand. Hi, Anka. Thank you so much. I've been looking forward to this presentation. I know, um, and I, I don't really have a, 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 a clearly formulated question, but just want to see if you can go further in in a few points of your discussion. And I'm kind of picking up on the on the on the chat that we got to have uh, a few Tuesdays ago or Thursdays ago on the fellows meeting which is really about trying to get to the role of aesthetics uh, in the capacity to produce the possible or an expanded sense of the possible uh, and the value that that has, and understanding the value that has uh, in transformative change. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the stuff that has uh, that that you talked about today and a lot of the stuff that that certainly is going on in Canada are are issues of of uh, critiques of power critiques of structure things like that which I have found mostly to be distributive but not transformative that they aren't 
changing a paradigm. They're just redistributing, which is, I mean, and that's not to dismiss their value. It's just not doing the thing, yeah. you know, that we're really interested in doing. And I'm really interested in your, your capacity in management studies to look at, at the role of aesthetics as a context in which to try and register this something more, that relationship between aesthetics and, and, and transformation. And one point I wanted to make is, is to address, is to, is to raise the work of Claire Bishop, who's an American mm -hmm. art historian, yep. has a book called Artificial Hells. Mm -hmm. yes. And it's, it's about the kind of social practice art movement where a sort of disavowed relationship to the aesthetic. Let's not make art, let's do real things in yep. the real world yep. and solve real problems. Yep. And I think she's right on in her critique to say, artists are really, uh, they claim a lot of virtue for themselves in doing that, so long as they don't have to compare themselves to actual social workers or actual community development projects, that they love to, they love to compare a kind of social practice art um, approaches to stuff that goes on walls in galleries but they aren't so comfortable when they're comparing it and do not want to compare it to, to people who aren't artists that are working in the context of social change, often in much more effective ways. And I think that bears some relationship to some of the things that you're talking about. But you said something in this talk and it was the most exciting remark. And then you said, but I think I'm not gonna talk about that. And it was, <laughs> you said they were decided by aesthetic practices something in the arts run center around i think it was that the, the the four principles were all interpretive as you said and how to imply them and engage with them was decided by aesthetic practices i think is that yeah and, and no i didn't that? i didn't say decide but i said sided so it was um aligned did you say uh, aligned aligned yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, um, what is this is something about the space. Um, so it's very much a special special perspective that um, kind of is forced upon you when you're there. Is that um, um, that the way um, space is outlined and um, and um, loaded with certain kind of atmospheres. And, and well, this is an aesthetic practice. Um, 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 how you say, um, pro provides affordances for a particular way of behaving. Mm -hmm. That does not mean that it forces you. It creates the possibility, you know, sensibly to, to, to behave in a certain way. And um, for instance, PATH, um, it's very interesting. The one who has started it, he's um, a theater person. And um, he was um, driving around France to get, um, well, basically he just wanted to buy a house for himself to retire. And then he was standing in front of this huge rundown monastery and um, he just took all the money that he also saved for his re retirement, everything, and he just bought it. And then he called all his artist friends to say, okay, I just bought this real man monastery. We've been talking about this space that we all need to go and to work and to focus and make it also accessible to others. Let's do it together. And so they, he, like the space was first and then they, they tried to figure out how to do this. And as this place is not meant for exhibition or anything, you know, it's like it's creating the conditions for work. That's what they want to do. So it's not for outside. And um, so what is interesting to talk with him about is the way he, he senses the space. And for him, it's very, very important to this, this aesthetic level of um, organizing the space. And he says, what he's doing, he's always creating paradoxes aesthetically so that you can never be sure this is the rule, I just follow the rule. So that you need to negotiate that. You need to ask, so so how does it work? And then others might not know. And, and um, so he always has this, um, also aesthetically, this um, 
a sense for um, this is a place of abundance and it's totally run down. This is a, a place, um, you know, like we also have, um, how you call it? Uh, how you call these birds that are, um, that are beautiful, but you, you can't use them for anything that have these beautiful, you know, peacocks. They, they, peacocks, exactly. They have peacocks just for the, because they're not doing anything. It's not functional at all. And yet they are constantly struggling with money. So, and it's quite clear because everybody's discussing it. So, you know, he's constantly creating this kind of weird paradoxes and that keeps you kind of attentive. Um, maybe that's a, mm -hmm. yeah. D did you get the sense that you could take some of the ideas that are being tried out in that context understand the way in which the aesthetic provokes different levels of awareness, behavior, engagement with others, and then either transfer them or scale them? Or does it, I mean, is this because it is such a countercultural little collection of people? And in that regard, maybe a bit of a bad data point in terms of being able to go and take this into a corporate landscape and, and be able to apply some of those principles. Mm. Well, to be very frank, I would never take that into, into a corporate landscape, okay. never, ever, because this is not scalable that, you know, whenever you start to use these measures on these kind of, you know, practices, they just crumble. And um, you, well, you can do it. Um, I mean, aesthetic practices in order to create atmospheres that afford certain kind of, you know, behavior mm -hmm. are done all the time in the corporate sector. You know, you just go into a shop, they, 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 um, they use scent, they use a certain outline, they use light, they, you know, they already do this, you know, and, but we're not aware of that. Um, but they do it for a certain function. And, um, and there it's, they do it for a very different reason. And um, I don't think that you can just, you know, it's not, it's impossible because the, the, um, I think the the basic um, how do you say it the basic um, the value the values are very differently and the basic focus of how to do this is, is differently and um, and the whole thing is that um, these are organizing practices that are not management practices. And uh, yes, it's very small, but. Um, but uh, there are already alternative ways of organizing and also alternative uh, enterprises and um, community economies. And I think oh, they're already there, you know? And I think for this, it would be suitable to, to try to formulate this kind of principles in whatever way, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, I remember that Elon had a second point, but if, mm. And I will, I, I hear you, Ila, but yeah, Ilan, yeah. others actually have also a question or If not, then Ilan, please go ahead. Um, thanks, Annika, and also for those uh, comments, that was very helpful. I wanted to come back a little bit to something that you sort of touched on, but didn't, I, I would love to hear more because you mentioned in, in the idea of the speculative scenarios, the ideas of the narratives mm -hmm. and the performance of them. And I wonder if you can say a little more about how you see, what, what are narratives in this sense? Mm -hmm. And what value do they have in the sense of the future or of visioning, mm -hmm. if you will? Mm -hmm. Okay. So for me, narratives are sense-making practices um, because that's how we function, right? We, um, we see the world in, uh, in, uh, in a way to, like we discern certain elements and put them together and give them sense. This is how we basically have survived <laughs> so far. And, um, and um, these future narratives means that you engage with um, certain kind of, um, uh, how you call them in English? Um, wait. Um, it's not trends. 
but um, uh, patterns. Yeah, not patterns, but uh, maybe um, uh, um, aspects that might shape the future, okay. so events, you know, that might have trajectories. But um, so you, um, well, you first have to outline the, the space of, you know, what, what is it you want to look at? So is it this concrete factory in this natural reserve? So it's a very specific place. Or we have also been doing that with students for um, um, uh, a company that uh, is involved with the coffee sector. So what's the future in the coffee sector? And, um, and there you first have to outline, you know, what's the, what's the field? What, what, what are you looking at? And what are possible um, important uh, elements that might shape the future, or that you want to uh, it uh, that you want the future to be influenced by. Um, what you do then is um, you you use these elements and then you connect them in a, in a, either one way or three different ways, depending on you know how many scenarios you want to do, and then so you jump into the future by interconnecting them. You create a future and then what you usually do is backcasting to see how did you get there mm -hmm. and um so there on the one hand it's this well you do a lot of research on these elements of course um and it can be and there are these i don't know whether you know them the steeple or pestle criteria you know that you know you use uh, for that um and uh, so this is so, and to craft this narrative, what would have, you know, what happened first then what happened next, who are the actors, you know, who participate in, in, in it. And, um, and the, the, the second, I mean, this is the narrative itself. And the second, um, and it needs to be plausible and coherent, you know, this is, so you, you, you have these classical storytelling elements that create a, a good narrative. And the second level is how you perform it. And um, so you've seen these the students in the concrete factory, we went to the concrete factory and then they built the future. So they had like certain kind of, you know, um, um, material elements that help them to stage the future. That's what I do. They staged it. Mm. Um, and um, but we also have uh, or had um, the the coffee case, and then they created personas, and they have been the personas for for instance the CEO of the coffee company, who have been talking at the anniversary about the last ten years, which is the ten years from now and um, to, to make people immerse themselves into, into the narrative and it becomes much more convincing uh, in order to, to, to find that um, a viable possibility of the future. And if it's desirable, this future, then the question usually is in the room, so okay, what, so what's the next step? So what, mm -hmm. how, how do we go from here? I don't know whether this is a very good answer. Well, no, that's, that's very helpful. I think the point that, that sort of comes out of that that's maybe worth mentioning to distinguish from telling stories in and of themselves with the same elements, if you will. But the point is that there is a purpose. That is that you are trying to create a, an opera, something on which you can operate, if you will, in that future scenario mm -hmm. and that it's it's more than just performing it or telling a story um in this case it was the coffee company um but it there is a purpose in that narrative and and that's what drives it as a narrative beyond just another story and the, another way to tell a interesting story great thank yeah. you that's very helpful yeah yeah, so probably, um, so the, the, the purpose of this whole scenario um, experiments there is, um, is to, to render the future open, to make it, you know, to, that, that, to distribute the feeling that it is open and not determined. And, mm -hmm. and also that you can 
actually desire something, you know, and you can shape it with others. And it doesn't mean that this future will happen, but um, but you can contribute to it. One, one quick comment. I mean, David and I, I guess, you know, from the email exchanges have been thinking about aspects of this of narratives and um, what David has labeled sort of an algebra of the protagonist. And that tension in sense is what exists in this case between what is a narrative of the future and the intention that that narrative sets up so that there is a, a, a concern and interest of attention that keeps it keeps focus on how do you get there and what is it yeah Does that makes sense david is that am i re representing that appropriately yeah totally i mean it it is the challenge of trying to trying to get this stuff connected to the world in a way that actually does give it a level of transformative energy. And I think it's it's a problem in, in narratives where we can, you know, there's a lot of, of work on participatory futuring and, and uh, scenarios work, um, but the, 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 what is it that ties it back to the kind of normative dimensions that are acting in the world all the time, as you say, to set up the unsustainable world that we go back to living in all, you know, after we leave this, after we leave the, the participatory futuring exercise, after we stop doing the narratives piece, you know, and so I feel like we're at this moment right now where, where people like Elan and some of the other people that, that I've been working with um, in North America, we've, we've, We've trumpeted the value of, of arts and imaginative approaches and narratives around this virtue of possibility. Mm. And what I think we have not seen nearly enough of is the way that that expanded sense of possibility starts to actually act upon reality mm. uh, to a sufficient degree. And I gave that example when we were talking a couple of weeks ago where um, I'm working with the city of Toronto right now on setting up a relationship between the arts institutions in Toronto and mitigation targets. Mm -hmm. And the difference between this activity and what I've been doing in the past and what I think you're mostly talking about is they don't want the possible at this point. They're not interested in dreaming up different kinds of worlds that we live. They need to reduce emissions. And they, 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 and they just have to get emissions down and, and they've arrived at the what. And frankly, the what looks impossible to everybody. Even people who are really ambitious and optimistic, they've got, it's this transformed TO, it's these big ambitious climate targets and nobody knows how we're gonna meet them. Does the aesthetic have a role in that? Where we're not, you know, if we go in to the city of Toronto and say, well, we didn't do anything about lowering emissions, but we've got lots of cool possible cities that we could make real. You know, they don't want to hear that anymore. And I sympathize with them at this point for not because because what what artists and academics have done a lot is just kind of offer different questions and explore different things, which mm -hmm. we've argued for a long time is really important. And I, I think there is a there is a a degree to which it is really important, but can we join this push towards real reductions in emissions right now? And does the aesthetic have a role in that? And if so, what is it? How do you deploy it? How do you scale it? And how do you measure it? Are these questions that I think that's where the burden of and the sort of the, the, the kind of edge of this work needs to go now uh, because I think there is a there's we've got decades of this kind of you know um, expanding the possible and participatory futuring and and the, and the claim that this increases a level of agency and such we get that but it's all self-reporting that people say at least the stuff that I've seen and looking at the way in which that actually translates into collective action is the sort of the question I think we should burden ourselves with over the next couple of months. Just to, to add one thing, David, that I think the point is also that 
the kinds of things that you and Annika and others are doing with the aesthetics. The point is not that it is aesthetics, but that it is, that the aesthetics have a very profound, under the right conditions and done in the right way, have a profound effect on that algebra of the protagonist, on that yeah. tension, yeah. and on the kind of emotional drive that has to be instilled. It's not just about yeah. what is the right thing to do, but who's going to do it and how. I mean, and just really quickly uh, uh, okay i didn't mean to sound frustrated not with your work it's it's what i've like yeah. i've i haven't produced anything good at right. this point is sort of how i feel guys just one moment we got almost to an end but adrienne wants to come <laughs> in so i would say good. adrienne has a final question and then anke has a final word for today okay <laughs> It is not a final. It is not a final question. First of all, I apologize so much that I couldn't uh, attend earlier, Anke. But that what I got from you is really, really cool, and I'm looking forward to have more, uh, more uh, uh, discussions with you. But what is important? I, I mean, this I want to say to 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 David. David, if you really want to to give the statics a, a role. You also need money for it, <laughs> money for transformation. It is, as you know, with the help of the uh, of the institute, I'm uh, in in the moment very close to get hopefully this fund, aesthetics and sustainability, being financed by the next yes, 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 by the next um, government, and then we can really talk about what is the role of the aesthetics so far we don't have the money you don't get money you don't get funded if you want to be the aesthetic part of sustainability because then the sustainability people say yeah, but we don't have this it's not in our criteria. we will not have the money for that i'm sorry and so is vice versa so i'm looking really forward to have on a very cool and great level uh, an experience um, of of yeah researches between scientists, artists, and people coming from the social movements to to make a real serious contribution to the transformative duty we have. Fantastic. Or maybe we could we could do that after the the elections because then we need probably all your power and all your imagination <laughs> and all your speed to bring this topic to to politics. Thanks, Anke. And Thank I you. I try to to find you as soon as possible. When they put me now in seven days quarantine in Israel. <laughs> When yeah. they accept that the uh, exhibition is um, is a reason to go to Israel in this moment, but if they um, um, will will accept, then I'm in seven, seven days in quarantine, and then I can have long discussions with them because <laughs> I'm glued. What a stupid idea! Okay, <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, Thanks. Hey, Ben Anke, the last word is yours for today. Oh, great. I have this. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, uh, David, uh, just, just to give it a little lift. Um, I actually think also with the carbon footprint um, issue, let's put it this way, um, there are uh, senses of possibility in there at the moment that's called technology. They're very good at selling you that this is this is the, the way to go forward and they use exactly the same strategies. Um, and um, maybe for me, it's, I think, in order to reach this kind of um, practical, you know, like grip on transformation, um, I think the um, this, what I said, it, this um, this practice of reading for difference, you know, because you say carbon footprint issues are questions of how to change behavior. And you change behavior either by force or by will. And I rather um, create with people an, an idea of an alternative way of behaving that's 
you know, fun or it's pleasing or that gives you something, a sense of abundance, for instance, for time because you don't have to travel or whatever, uh, then uh, then force force them. I mean, maybe it's like it's a combination of the two, but um, I think um, aesthetic practice or aesthetics is much more than just to have like this fluffy, airy thing that is somewhere in the air. But I think for me, at least, it is um, a method and a tool, and I don't necessarily would call myself an artist. I just use aesthetic practices um, in order to get somewhere else where you can imagine, you know, a different kind of behavior, and you you can imagine this different kind of behavior because you want this rather than the, what you have got at the moment. That's that's just my personal trying to stay positive. <laughs> of uh yeah yeah submitting to this hopeful project of reading for difference and that's conclu that concludes today's tuesday talk once again thank you very much anke for your presentation and also to all of you for the very lively discussions and it seems to be there will be ongoing lively discussions over the next months actually on that topic and having said that i wish you all a good afternoon and hopefully see you around one way or the other soon bye bye thanks uh, David,